Thanks, Mike, for the uh, the generous introduction, and um, thank thanks everybody for having me come to give a talk to you today. Thanks for the invitation on Groundhog's Day. Um, I'm not a groundhog, and I'm not a betting person, but I think that winter's here for a few more weeks. And also on the same thing, theme of Groundhog's Day, if um, if you like this lecture, I'll probably be giving it again for another 10, 50, 100 times, uh, you're welcome back. So today I'm going to be talking about a river's view of processes from the mantle to the critical zone. Um, in the past 25 or so years, we've learned how rivers um, are coupled to other uh, parts or components of Earth's system, including the lithosphere and climate. And this has been an exciting time for geomorphologists to do quantitative work as this, as we've had these large advances in computational ability with uh, geochronology and with digital topographic data sets improving every year. And today I'm going to share with you a few of the talk topics that I've been working on for the past five or so years since I've been here. Um, and they all are connected by the theme of fluvial geomorphology. And I'll demonstrate how we can use quantitative, uh, quantitative measurements of the landscape to better understand processes across a range of scales from the deeper mantle to the, or the upper mantle that is, to um, the upper few meters of Earth's surface in the critical zone. Oh, sorry, I guess that had been dimmed. Uh, I'm going to go through in this talk a few different uh, few different parts. I'm going to begin by giving a little bit of a background information on how rivers erode, particularly rivers that are running over bedrock or with just a thin veneer of alluvium on them, mostly what we see in mountains around here. Then I'll give a few vignettes about my research. The first will be about how we use rivers to detect and measure tectonic deformation. I'll go into a few uh, a caveat to that or complication where we have to understand something about how rivers are coupled to hill slopes and hill slopes are coupled to rivers and the interactions between those. Then I'll get on into a little bit of a discussion about microclimate and the effect that insulation has on uh, landscape morphology and erosion processes. And then I'll finish up talking about how rivers affect uh, chemical weathering rates in a erosive uh, limited landscapes. And none of this work could have been done alone and the better ideas and the harder work that have gone into this have really come in uh, large part through a lot of good collaborators that I've had over the years. Uh, for the tectonics vignette, this is a group of main collaborators. When I talk about the boulders and hill slopes, there's another set of collaborators. A bit about sunlight and microclimate has a set of collaborators, and then weathering. I've been working with another crew there. So a little background, and I'm not going to be talking about a lot of math in this talk. But I do want you to, or at least I feel that showing a few equations and helping you get comfortable with what these equations mean helps you understand the sorts of numbers that I'm going to be presenting as I go through most of this talk. And so first, I want to basically just describe the basic landscape evolution equation. Those of you who have had dynamic Earth so far will be familiar with the basic gist of this, the change in elevation through time of a point on Earth's surface is simply a function of the erosion rate and the uplift rate. Er erosion brings it down, uplift pushes the landscape up, a rock uplift does. And you can break the, the uh, or you can uh, calculate the erosion a few different ways. Right here, you can think of the processes that are taking place on uh, the hill slopes which are basically just this uh, following this diffusion equation. And then you can think of the, the processes that are occurring in the rivers, 
And I'm going to give this in terms of this, what we call the stream power law or the stream power, power family of models. And this is a fairly straightforward equation here. It's simply diffusion. It's a first order rate law. It happens on creeping hill slopes, all these nice convex soil mantled hill slopes that we have down the foothills here. It's good evidence of, of this. This is a little bit more complicated or obscuring of, a, of an equation. And I just want to kind of unpack that a little bit. We have a coefficient times drainage area raised to some power times the local gradient raised to another power. And this can be derived from a basic uh, expectation that erosion rate is proportional to basal shear stress in the stream raised to some power. And this proportionality, we, well, we can write in terms of this equation here. And there's the in, intrinsic erodibility of the rock. We have to factor in um, this function of, of sediment discharge. Um, and that gets multiplied by your, your shear stress, perhaps minus some sort of critical shear stress for motion. But this, this function right here basically is shown up here in this graph. If you have too little sediment running or bouncing along the bed of your stream, you have no tools to abrade the bed. If you have too much sediment on the bed of your stream, the bed is completely covered. There's no interaction, no abrasion going on, and you can have no erosion. But there's some sweet middle ground right here where you have maximum amounts of erosion. Well, this basal shear stress can be calculated in, um, basically uh, for steady uniform flow and with some exponents that we draw from Manning's equations. We can come up with this relationship here, which recasts basal shear stress in terms of discharge and channel width and the channel slope. All of this can be kind of combined and we can come up with this stream power equation. And then this, this coefficient K then includes a rockability term, erodibility term, a climate term, and a threshold term, and uh, as well as the, the sediment flux term. So a lot of that stuff, the, those nuts and bolts are hidden into that equation, but it is uh, based on basically a proportionality between shear stress and uh, erosion rate. And this, that simple equation gives rise to this, this uh, you know, landscape evolution model, which has been performing over there to the right. And you can see that just from these terms right here, we reproduce a lot of what we see in landscapes. That is a fractal river network, periodic valley and ridge spacings, a lot of those sorts of details, as well as you know, mysterious U-shaped mountains. What is the observational evidence for um, this sort of equation being appropriate? Well, if we basically assume steady state such that erosion rate and uplift rate are equal, we can rearrange that equation and solve for slope as a function of this term right here, uplift rate divided by erodibility raised to the power of one over n times um, drainage area raised to this negative ratio over there. And you can rewrite that in terms of logs and stuff like that. But what you end up getting when you plot drainage area on the x-axis and slope on the y-axis is you get this nice um, power law relationship or a linear relationship in log-log space where the slope of that line uh, is basically your, your um, M over N ratio. And then the Y intercept of that line would be this uh, U over K. And so this power, relation, power law relationship, again, we can calculate this steepness index or this concavity index from plots like this. And what's something else that we can do with this? Well, we can we can draw this relationship between that steepness index and this ratio of uplift rate over, over erodibility. And this would 
tell us that when we go to a, a region or a mountain range that has fast rock uplift rates, we'd expect to see steeper rivers. And when we go to mountain ranges that have low uplift rates, we'd expect more gentle sloping rivers. And we indeed see that here, if we go to the San Gabriel Mountains, a high uplift uh, river marked in red and a low uplift river marked in blue, we see the slopes in the areas produce these two nice consistent scaling relationships. Concavity is invariant with uplift rate. We expect that theoretically, and you see that here, but we see this nice relationship between the steepness index, which is basically just slope normalized for a drainage area. That's all steepness index really is. So we'd expect there to be some, from this equation, some nice linear relationship between steepness index and uplift rate if n is indeed one. And we can collect data uh, globally. Here are a lot of base and average erosion rates that I compiled uh, from um, basically cosmogenic data sets. Plotted those against normalized steepness indices. Uh, these are all published steepness indices. And we get a range, a large array of relationships, but for any one of these mountain ranges, say the, the greens from the Apennines or the blues from the San Gabriels, we get a fairly monotonic relationship between KSN or steepness index and the erosion rate. If you take the log log, um, or if you log the axes, uh, the data kind of collapse on one another. Uh, the spread in the vertical, here is really reflecting the different slopes of these arrays that mostly just is related to this K, climate, differences in climate or differences in rock erodibility. But for the large part, this is a fairly linear array. Arguably, that slope is about one, suggesting that N is about one. There's some indications that in some parts of the world, N is greater than one a little bit. Some parts of the world, it might be a little less than one, but globally, and is pretty close to one. And we're going to uh, see some more evidence for that in a little bit. So I just showed you at steady state what happens in a river, how we distinguish rivers that are have high uplift rates or low uplift rates. What is the transient response of a river if you change the rock uplift, rock uplift rate in that basin? Well, you'd expect that it's going to respond and try to achieve a steeper slope. And it does this, it basically goes from this original concave form with a low, low steepness to a, a concave form with a higher steepness by this sort of reach replacement or this slope patch replacement where the stream, steep, the stream steepens at the, the outlet first, and that steeper stream kind of propagates its way up. And, and this, uh, this break and slope, this, this point that uh, separates the steeper stream, the newly adjusted stream from the old low gradient stream is called a nick point. And so when you go to a landscape and you see this low gradient reach um, with with a nick point and a steep, uh, steeper st uh, reach below that, uh, one of the things that might tell you is that this lower um, gradient uh, reach is in equilibrium still to some past um, boundary condition. It's not in equilibrium with the current boundary condition, but it reflects the old condition. And these, these nick points, they propagate vertically at a steady rate, which follows the rock uplift rate. And they march their way back uh, upstream um, as a kinematic wave with a, a speed that is proportional to the drainage area. So it starts out really fast and then it slows down as it gets closer and closer to the headwaters. Now, working with slope area data can be a little bit difficult at times. It's a lot easier. We realize uh, we, we kind of discovered this in the last five years, 10 years. It's a lot easier to do this sort of analysis. Just dealing with elevation and um, sl um, distance data, basically by reprojecting or transforming stream profiles 
which are functions of elevation distance, into something we call a chi plot or the chi transform. Basically, we transform this upstream distance into this metric chi, which is simply an upstream um, integrated or streamwise up, upstream integrated uh, integration of drainage area. And this takes the concave stream profile that we're all familiar with, and it turns it into a straight line. And in this case, the slope of that line is proportional to your steepness index. If you make this uh, reference drainage area one, then that slope is perfectly equal to your uh, steepness index, the same steepness index we could calculate with the slope area data. Now, given what I said about the, the nick points all migrating up uh, vertically at the uplift rate, uh, one thing that we should expect is if we see transient nick points in the landscape, uh, such as these in uh, the San Gabriel Mountains, that they all occur at the same elevation or very similar up elevations if the uplift rate is uniform, spatially uniform. And we can see these regular long profiles down here. And I've just kind of projected a, a thousand meter contour through across those. And you can see that all these nick points are about at a thousand meters. That's the same contour that's shown in black here in the map above. The other thing that we'd expect for transient nick points that are all responding to the same perturbation or boundary uh, condition change is that they occur at the same chi value. And the nice thing about this chi transform is it takes all of these profiles, which are kind of scattered all about, and it collapses them onto one another. And so all these little breaks in slope right here in these chi plots are re representing nick points. And the fact that they overlie one another is consistent with this idea that these nick points are all related to each other and they're just speeding up the, the drainage network as, as a response to this change in rock uplift rate. Now, another interesting thing about this chi transform or this chi variable is that it is proportional to the river response time. And so we can turn chi, which is a distance metric into time by basically factoring in the erodibility, the rock erodibility, which is something that, that we can calculate from that erosion rate and steepness or erosion rate and uh, yeah, steepness uh, relationship that I showed a few slides ago. And this river response time is simply the amount of time that it takes for any point on this stream to sense the perturbation uh, or the amount of time between a perturbation and the, and the time that it reaches that point. So. You know, this might be a zero response time at the far left and a 30 million year or 10 million year response time at the far right of that river. And that would tell you in this case that, let's say this is 5 million years right here where this nick point is, that these points right here at that 5 million year mark are just now responding to a perturbation that began 5 million years ago, because that's their response time. And the other thing is we can take the slope of this tau plot and that is simply equal to the rock uplift rate. So that, this is information that we can back out from these, uh, these sorts of plots. So now let's use some of this information. And I'm just gonna tell you a bit about how we, uh, we can read tectonics or we can use that tau plot as a tape recorder of a landscape to figure out how uplift rates have changed over time. And we're gonna, gonna give a few examples. The first example is here from the Central Anatolian Plateau in uh, Turkey. I'm gonna look specifically at the South Anatolian margin, the, uh, or the Southern margin of that. The entire plateau formed as a result of convergence between the African and the Arabian plates relative in the uh, Anatolian plate here. And the southern margin 
began a initial slow uplift at about 8 million years ago. There was a little bit more rapid uplift occurring after about 1.6, but we have only some faint ideas, or until a couple of years ago, only some faint ideas about when after 1.6 has happened. And the potential uplift mechanism here was has been debated. We have a, a subduction zone, a, a north polarity subduction zone down here on the south side of the, of the plateau. So subduction is towards the north. And this is a great place to you know, have some uplifting territory, but whether that was due to thermal viscous four arc uplift, crustal underplating, continental collision, because this is kind of con this is continental crust under Cypress here, which is being trying to ram down the, the throat of the subduction zone or whether uh, this, this downgoing cypress slab broke off or tore, and that caused this uplift. Again, it's been debated. So we can basically try to figure out which of these mechanisms is most likely by looking at the time scale of this, this uplift. If it's something very rapid, then maybe the, the break off is more likely. If it's a slow, gradual, protracted uplift, then one of these other three mechanisms might be more likely. Here are just a geologic map of the southern margin and the eight drainage basins that we looked at. Here are some river profiles. On the left, it's just your standard longitudinal profiles. And on the right side are the chi transforms of those profiles. And so we can see that all these profiles are kind of stacking up quite nicely with one another. Again, consistent with the fact that uh, they have these, uh, these nick points, which are all responding to the same tectonic perturbation or boundary condition change. It could be climate, but this is, this is uplift. And the other thing that we did is we estimated that ratio M over N by minimizing the misfit between these uh, profiles as we varied um, M over N. And we came up with the best fit of of about a ratio of about 0.3. Um, standard kind of globally average values are about 0.5. This is less than that, but it, uh, it did work the best. And we can calculate the value of M, which is 0.3, if we assume that N equals one. And N again is that exponent on, on slope. The next thing we did was calibrated K and basically check to see whether n is reasonably equal to one. Um, my colleague, Simone Riccano, he was a PhD student at the time. He went and measured a bunch of, or mapped a bunch of marine terraces on the southern margin, and he estimated their dates. And from that, we came up with an uplift rate uh, between each of those, basically the uplift rate that uh, occurs between each of these uh, these terraces, and then we calculate the, the stream steepness in between each of those terraces to come up with these data right there. And to, we fit a, a line to that, projected it to the origin, and that gave us a value of k. Um, this seems to be fairly linear, despite these really fast uplift rates. Um, but again, this is consistent with our assumption that n is equal to 1. Quite nicely, there's a river over to the east here that kind of runs up through here to the Moot Basin. And we have some um, incision rates off some terraces there. And that incision rate is also consistent with this projected line. Now we can take, we took those chi plots, we took that value of K and we basically came up with the tau plot that I showed you before came up with a response time. And we can basically do a linear inversion of those, those uh, plots to come up with a model uplift history. And so these are the, the model uplift, uplift, histories for, uplift histories for the four Western basins and four Eastern basins. Here's kind of the, the mean values for those basins. But we can see that Less than a million years ago, almost half a million years ago, we had a really rapid uh, change in uplift rate. It went from about two kilometers of uplift per million years up to 
five, six kilometers per million years, which is just a screamingly fast rate um, compared to other famous origins such as the Himalaya or the Southern Alps. But this is consistent with uh, the marine terrace data, which is plotted in blue there, and paleontological or not, uh, but paleontop paleontological evidence for um, the age of some of these sedimentary rocks, these marine units, which are now on the top of that plateau, that uppermost terrace surface. There are some remains, some datable remains there, which put that marine unit at about 0.5 million years in age. So this is a really short-lived uplift event, a really fast uplift event. And just coincidentally, if you look at the seismic tomography below this area, there's a map up on the top here, which is kind of projected down onto this larger map of Anatolia. And Anatolia north is to the bottom and right. Sorry about that. But here's the seismic tomographic interpretation with these blue cold slabs uh, shown here, dipping down towards the north. And there's a little tear which shows in some of the tomographic images in the cypress slab. And the exact nature of that tear, the size of the tear is a little bit unclear in some of the images, but it definitely seems to be there. And given the fact that we have uplift begin, really fast in the west and then migrate towards the east. Uh, we hypothesize that that is uh, due to a kind of a west to east uh, propagation of the tear. But the tear is ge geodynamically uh, speaking, the only so far reasonable explanation for why the uplift rates here were so fast and so short lived. Another place that we have tried uh, doing the same sort of technique is looking in uh, the Appalachian Mountains, specifically the Central Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachians have gone through a number of different orogenies, uh, the Mes Meso Mesoproterozoic Grenville orogeny and the Paleozoic Appalachian orogeny caused massive amounts of crustal thickening. And that led to the buildup of Pan or the first with the Grenville, we assembled Rodinia, and then with the Appalachian orogeny, we assembled Pangaea. And then that broke apart. And since 185 million years ago, this has been a passive margin. So tectonically, kind of a dead area. We do see a few interesting things that have happened. There's evidence for Jurassic and Eocene magmatism. The Jurassic magmatism is shown here in the yellow uh, triangles. Eocene magmatism is shown in the, the red triangles. This is bimodal magmatism. Uh, a lot of a, a very mafic components as well, uh, which suggests some mantle um, source, as well as a more felsic component, which is showing some crustal uh, interactions. One thing one can ask is what happened to cause the magmatism here, since it was this didn't happen until more than 30 million years after this really became a, a solid trend, uh, passive margin. But from my standpoint, I'm interested in why the central Appalachians are still as high as they are. I mean, it's not a huge mountain range, super tall mountain range like the Wasatch or the Rockies, perhaps, but they still stand at 1,500 meters elevation here in West Virginia. And we'd expect that in 185 million years, there'd be plenty of time to wear this down to a very flat surface. So something is maintaining this this region topographically. A few interesting things have uh, shown, shown up since about 2014 with some of Fan Chi's work. And uh, there are these, seism these tomographic, uh, seismic tomographic images here from Schmant and Lin in 2014, which resolved this seismically um, fast region right here, or seismically slow region, sorry, under um, kind of uh, north central Virginia. Um, uh, here's another tomographic map from a slightly more recent paper, uh, which shows that same slow region a little bit farther 
to the West and to West Virginia. There are about five or six different papers which have all done variations of this using slightly different tomographic methods. And they all kind of show this consistently placed slow region you know, in the upper mantle, let's say about 80, 90, 100 kilometers in depth. Here are some cross sections along this, this line X to X prime. And the topographic profile is up here in the, the thin line at the top. And what we see here is again, this slow region extends down into the upper mantle consistently in all the, in the top two tomographic uh, images. There's also, based on receiver functions, uh, a very much thinned lithosphere underneath the highest elevations and in association with this seismically slow region. Uh, the volcanoes are shown right here also along, along that profile. So these volcanoes are, so, are lining up above this lithospheric divot as well. And then this is some electrical resistivity data down on the bottom here which is basically showing um, very low resistivities. Uh, and these are all consistent with there having to be some small amount of partial melt uh, today. So there's clearly been some sort of uh, lithospheric modification here. And does this, this region of this thin lithosphere and this seismically slow area have any topographic expression. We um, looked at the, or mapped the, the steepness index in this map here. This has been smoothed with a low pass filter. And we see a broad region of steep slopes uh, right above this central Appalachian anomaly. You can plot these, um, channel steepness values across this swath profile from northwest to southeast, northwest to southeast in that direction. And here's the topography across that swath profile. These red dashed lines show where the anomaly is in the subsurface. And we see that no matter what rock type you're in, whether it's basalt, carbonate, conglomerate, granite, sandstone, mudstone, they all pretty much rise and lower across or had this arched pattern across this uh, central Appalachian anomaly. So they're all getting steep, whether you're in a carbonate or a granite, these, your, your streams are getting steeper as you go up onto the, the flanks of this anomaly. Next, we wanted to calculate what uh, our value K was. And so we got some erosion rates and we plotted them up here, binned by basically igneous or metamorphic down here, um, or quartzite, and um, metasedimentary mudstones and sandstones shown in the blue. So there are basically two different scaling arrays here uh, be between erosion rate and steepness index. So we kind of came up with two different K values for the lack of anything else to do. And, um, we can convert that into an erosion rate. And so we basically took your, our steepness index, turned that, it, converted that into an erosion rate map, and came up with this. So again, we still see that nice uh, bullseye of fast erosion rates, relatively fast, 40 million or 40 meters per million years, which is not a Himalayan or South Anatolian plateau sorts of rates, but still fast in terms of the Appalachians. Next, we went and we looked for nick points. And this is just an example of uh, the Susquehanna Basin. Uh, using an automated uh, detection technique, we mapped all these nick points in white. And here in black triangles are some that I just selected manually. But one thing that you see is that um, if we convert chi to tau using our erodibility, we we can kind of map tau throughout our basin here, where blues are really low values, like less than 5 million years. Reds are old values over 30 million years. 
And we see a lot of these nick points line up in this gray, grayish region. They seem to cluster spatially around that gray 15 to 20 million year response time. And if you actually go and you plot out um, the ages of all your nick points, you see again, there is this cluster right about 15 to 20 million years. You could say, well, that's just because, um, well, the red shows the distribution of nick points. The gray and the black line with the gray envelope around it shows the distribution of just the, the channel network itself. And you could say, well, there's there are more nick points at about 15 to 20 million years because there are more channel reaches there to begin with. But we we basically resampled our um, channel network using the Monte Carlo routine to basically come up with some theoretical nick point locations and some sort of distribution, some confidence interval around that. And this basically shows that the observed nick point density at 15 to 20 million years is more than we'd expect by simply randomly selecting nick points from the channel network. And if we do the same sort of inversion, then we see that, um, well, those results are plotted up here with these, these colorful lines for the Delaware Basin, the Susquehanna Basin, the Potomac, and the Kanawha. We have basically low uplift rates until about 30 million years and things start to ramp up. In some basins, it starts at maybe 30, others maybe 25 million years. We really don't reach the, their maximum uplift rates until about 20 or 15 even. And their basin average, we're getting, looking at rates of about 20, million, million, uh, 20 meters per million years. And these results are consistent with what we see from offshore sedimentation rates in the Baltimore Canyon trough, which spike at about, which rise up at about 20 million years ago and spike at about 12. And also it's broadly consistent with uh, low temperature thermal chronology from the Catskill Mountains, which show some sort of change in exhumation rate at about 22 million years ago. <clears throat> and so we see from this some evidence for a recent rock uplift, total of about 400 meters. Fastest model erosion rates are over that central Appalachian anomaly. The preferred model of lithospheric removal um, is by Rayleigh Taylor instability. It maybe happened twice, once in the Jurassic, causing the Jurassic volcanism, once in the Eocene. But this, um, this divot has been maintained basically, like uh, possibly by ongoing shear driven upwelling associated with small scale mantle flow. That's maintaining the mantle uh, divot as well as um, this topography. So the takeaways from this. River profiles can record uplift patterns and history on time scales, basically between typical geo and thermal chronological methods. And it's sensitive to deformation, which is not elucidated otherwise by structures or modern ge geodesy. And I do have to fly through a few more vignettes here, but uh, the first one that I want to talk about is the effect of boulders and uh, streams and stream erosion. Here is a uh, couple results from a few studies that I did with colleagues, uh, Georgie Bennett and Charlie Shobe, looking at uh, the Eel River Basin in Northern California. This is on the Mendocino crustal conveyor where basically we have crustal thin thickening and thinning that's occurring as the Mendocino tri uh, triple junction migrates towards the north. And this thickening and thinning is basically creating a to topographic uh, welt that is migrating towards the north, you could think, think of. And so this is causing a landscape response. And we see a lot of nick points occurring in the Eel River Basin. And uh, <clears throat> My colleague Georgie went and she mapped all the earth flows she could find in Google Earth using the historical aspect of Google Earth. It's great. She could see things moving. She could calculate earth flow velocities. And from those velocities, she could calculate some erosion rate or estimate an erosion rate. And so 
this is a stream profile right here with kind of the, the ridge line up in the top there, but you can see a nice big nick point right there in the Mad River, and you can see all these earth flows and debris slides that she's mapped in the vicinity of that nick point. This is just the steepness index plotted there on the river, but here you can see the erosion rates and the earth flows and debris slides that are really ramping up you know, near that nick zone. <clears throat> The question is, we're dumping all this material, including really big four meter diameter boulders into the river. What effect is that having on river erosion rates? And it's kind of counterintuitive, but um, the, the, if you look at the erosion rates versus the steepness indices in these, Franci these really soft, deformable Franciscan um, lithologies, the, the melange, we see that the, the, these erosion rates and these steepness indices indicate that the rocks there are um, not very erodible compared to these non-Franciscan rocks uh, closer to the coast, which are sandstones, much more competent rocks, but they seem to be much uh, more erodible. And Charlie did a little bit of nice modeling on this. Uh, basically, he asked the question, if we, if we look at the, the boulders that we see in the KGF units, we don't see in the non-KGF units, and we basically ask ourselves, for a given concentration of boulders, how much steeper does that river have to be to erode at the same rate? You can come up with this steepening ratio. Basically, how much steeper this boulder filled um, stream has to be then a stream with no boulders at all to erode at the same rate. And this is occurring because all those boulders create a lot of drag that the water has to flow around that reduces the, the ability for it to erode. And so basically uh, the models, well, the observations suggest that the channels in the, the Franciscan um, have to be two to three times steeper to erode at the same rate. And the model also suggests that the streams, um, the, these boulder filled streams will steepen two to three times uh, in, under kind of conditions that we, the range of conditions that we see in these uh, Franciscan channels. <clears throat> so the takeaway there is that watch out for the core sediment delivery, such as boulders, it can slow your response time. And if you're going to be modeling things like tau and inverting uh, uplift histories from the river profiles, you need to think about whether uh, this is a factor or not. Next, how does sunlight push landscapes around? So there's a common observation in many parts of the world, particularly where you have rocks that are not, or that are fairly weak, uh, ones that are not uh, too resistant, that topography is asymmetric. There tends to be a steeper pole-facing uh, slope, such as these vegetated north-facing slopes, um, as compared to the south-facing uh, slope here. And this is from the Gabalin Mesa in California, but you see this occur you know, all up and down um, from Ca Canada and Alaska down to Mexico into the equator. And then we see the opposite sort of relationship when we get down into the southern hemisphere, that these pole facing slopes are steeper. And this has been inferred to be the result of uh, differences in insulation and microclimate. Um, but in some locations, such as the Gabalin Mesa, it's been thought that channel migration and undercutting is causing the asymmetry as well. The microclimate insulation according to these models over here, might be expected to make this landscape lean towards the north and those and it would push those divides towards the north, whereas channel migration undercutting would basically result from sediment that comes off of these longer basins, gets dumped into these trunk channels, and these alluvial fans basically push this trunk stream towards the south, and that undercuts this slope and pushes this trunk stream towards the south. And so these are kind of two competing hypotheses that have been thought about in this location. 
And so we did some modeling. We'll just kind of skip over much of this, but we can we can model the aspect dependence of runoff, the aspect dependence of soil creep, of regolith strength, and undercutting to come up with some basic model predictions of what we'd expect the different erosion rates that we'd see on the different sides of the stream uh, of the ridges, as well as the, the total amount of asymmetry that we see on the different sides of the ridges. This is just a, a aspect dependent uh, runoff model where we have less runoff of the sunny south facing slopes than on the, the, the shady north facing slopes. And you can see that this model right here just kind of predicts this nice migration of streams towards the north as those, uh, as those slopes lengthen out. If you measure the soil strength and the infiltration rates, uh, we did this at a few locations. Uh, we see that uh, on the north facing slopes, um, the field saturated hydraulic conductivity is, uh, is greater. Then on the south facing slopes, uh, basically this means that the north facing slopes have less runoff. And if we measure the, the shear strength of the soils, basically we found that there are weaker uh, sh uh, soil shear strengths on the north facing slopes. This result is consistent with the, the asymmetry that we see. And this is inconsistent with the asymmetry that we saw. Uh, we collected some erosion rate data, just again to compare to the model outputs. And these were just cosmogenic detrital uh, sand samples collected from alluvial uh, fans. Here's a uh, Paul for scale collecting some that, is, that are coming down from the left, but there's a, a sample location over here on the right across that valley where we collected some in the alluvial or in the alluvial. Um, base of that uh, that gully. And if we plot these erosion rates, which are the circles with the air bars against the model prediction for erosion rate asymmetry on the y-axis and slope asymmetry, these are all the results from the lateral channel migration. These are all the results from the uh, aspect dependent runoff and regolith strength. Again, we can ignore the regolith strength results, but we see kind of a scatter of erosion rates. Some of the erosion rates are really consistent with the, the model results. Um, the erosion rates and the topographic asymmetries are consistent with the model results for the runoff asymmetry from insulation. And there are a few results which are consistent with the channel migration. So in various parts of the Gabalon Mesa, it seems like Channel, the channel is migrating towards the south, undercutting, causing some slope lengthening. And um, in other parts, these uh, south facing slopes are leaning back and perhaps migrating towards the north. Still a little bit unclear. But one of the takeaways from this is that small differences in climate can lead to outsized differences in erosion patterns and, patterns and topography. And also as climate warms and vegetation responds, erosion mechanisms that are more efficient on slopes of a certain aspect today may become more uh, equally efficient on all slopes. And so there are gonna be topographic changes due to climate changes in the future. And finally, I just wanna wrap up this talk, talking briefly about rivers as gatekeepers to weathering in the critical zone. This is a study that was we've been working on in Guadeloupe and the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean. It's a French island, and they have their own uh, critical zone observatory system down there, much like we have our own system here in the United States. Um, it's a volcanic island, less than 2.7 million years old, um, mostly composed of andesites. There's some young volcanoes in the southern end, and older volcanoes in the north that are extinct. In the northern end of the island, you can walk around and you can measure these six 
meter or greater than six meter thick soils. This is this probe right here is six meters tall. It didn't reach bedrock. Across these soily surfaces, we just have these streams run, but then they fall over these nick points, and then you get these deeper in size streams with big andesite boulders crumbling around. And we, while we have, we can measure the or the weathering rates here, which are among the fastest on Earth. We also have these really thick soils. Um, again, greater than six meters there, but geophysically in various parts of the this um, critical zone observatory, the soils, the saprolites have been measured or estimated to be more than 20 meters thick. So just really, really thick soils. And how do we maintain such rapid uh, weathering rates if we have really, really thick soils? Obviously the two are consistent with one another. You wanna get thick soils without lots of weathering, but at some point, maybe the soils start, become such a barrier that they can slow down um, the weathering rates. And so we're interested in how weathering rates vary with landscape position and soil thickness on this island. We went through mapped nick points. Again, found that they're consistent with being some transient pulse of nick points migrating up through the system. And so we mapped out the edges of these nick points and use the hill slope features to basically define a relic surface. Everything above it is where we expect to find the thick soils. Everything downstream is where we expect to find thin soils. This is not responding to any uplift pulse. This is just what we'd expect to see on any old volcanic island, say, as the drainage network starts to integrate and nick points propagate up towards the, the head of the island. And you can see in that this model, some of those nick points basically migrating northward or inland. Sorry. What are the erosion or the, the weathering rates that we observe and the relationships with nick points? Uh, this is from one of our small basins, the Quick River Basin, where there, which has been densely um, sampled and monitored. Here we uh, plot the total weathering rate against uh, chi and the, this gray line marks the chi value where we saw a nick point. So everything upstream of that nick point is weathering really slowly. Everything down, well, then we see an, uh, an abrupt jump in the weathering rate downstream of that. We can plot that instead as weathering rate against the percent of runoff from the relic surface, in which case we see a slightly more linear relationship but again, it basically is telling us that when you're on the relic surface, weathering rates are really, really slow. It might just be due to dust input, the dust that's blowing in from Africa, that's being deposited on the surface and that's weathering. If we go around the whole island and do a similar sort of exercise, we get a pretty similar result. Low uh, weathering rates above nick points, faster weathering rates below nick points. And we basically see that as being, or we explain that with this schematic diagram right here. When you're above the nick point where the erosion, the physical erosion rates are pretty slow, we accumulate these thick soils. They haven't had time to be eroded away. The water flow paths don't penetrate through these thick soils anymore. And so the water is just, it's not reacting with anything. The minerals have all been reacting. And so when that water comes back out, it uh, doesn't have any soil roots in it. The, a few flow paths might flow all the way down to fresh bedrock, but more, more of these flow paths are coming in below the neck point, interacting with the bedrock and weathering that bedrock. Uh, just a couple days ago, um, Sue Brantley came out with this really nice article in science, basically explaining a lot of this sort of thing as the difference between what we see in a kinetic limited regime and an erosive transport limited regime, where again, here in these kinetic limited regimes, bedrock is at or near the surface, water can react with it very easily. And so you get fast um, chemical weathering. And it's only the, the rate of that chemical weathering is dependent only on the precipitation rates and the, the temperature. 
But when you get into an erosive transport limited regime, again, you have this blanket of thick soils, which are tamping down the weathering rates and basically meaning that it doesn't matter what the temperature is, it doesn't matter what the precipitation is, that stuff ain't weathering. And so we come up with some sort of model like this, where through time, the weathering rate has changed on this island. At first, we had the volcano form. And so we were basically weathering these fresh hill slopes, these fresh lava flows, thick soils were able to form. But the physical erosion rates were pretty slow. And so over time, the, the soils got thicker, the weathering rate went down. And then due to river integration and incision, below those nick points, we were able to basically boost the weathering rates. And that's propagating, that signal's propagating upstream. So eventually the entire island or much of the island will be weathering at a faster rate again until again, er uh, erosion rates decline, thick soils accumulate again, and the weathering rates go back down. And so we're, are kind of bouncing between this kinetic limited regime and erosive tran uh, transport limited regime, at least a couple of times on this island. And the take home message from this is that chemical weathering is paced by river incision, especially in these erosive transport limited regions. Chemical weathering can be very non-uniform and unsteady at the basin scale. So don't just take a water sample from some random field location and expect that weathering rate to be representative of you know, really what's upstream because half of that area upstream could be erosive transport limited, half of it could be kinetic limited. You really don't know until you put your measurements into context. So know thy river, landscape context matters. And with that, I will wrap up. Thank you,